Praise God. Well, y'all doing okay tonight? Y'all made it out to the house of God? Look, I'm going to be honest with you. Tonight's going to be a lot different of a kind of like message. I think this is going to, we're going to really uh, try to do like a real, it's going to be like a Bible study, really. Uh, and, and we're going to get into some things. And so I, I guess, you know, Danielle's wanting titles. So I gave her a title. He conquered the spirits. But uh, as we move forward in this message, I, I just want to say this, like, um, well, first of all, as we get started, let me just go to a couple of scriptures um, that, I'd like to, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, let's see here. 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So sometimes this, this particular scripture right here, let's see where, where the wording, I'm looking for the King James Version right here, so just bear with me. I'm going to use a couple of different versions, but... Um, if you have if you have any question if I'm on an, if I'm on the ESV version and you're curious what a particular word in the Greek would mean if you let us know if you raise your hand and you kind of throw the word out there I'll get Aaron in the back to maybe look it up on his phone and then we'll um and then we'll just go ahead and, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we can answer that question for you but look I wanted to I wanted to talk to you real quick about this particular word right here. Uh, he says, Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled, which means to deceive Eve through his subtlety. He's trick. He's, he's tricky. He's slick. Right. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So one of the things that I wanted you to know is that a lot of times through the years, people have kind of in a way uh, come against some of my teaching, and I'm not here because I feel bad because people have come against my teaching. That's not my point. My point is this word simplicity right here. Okay. And people have come against some of my teaching. And what they have said is that you've moved away from the simplicity that is in Christ. And, 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 and so you're teaching things that it's hard for people to understand, okay? And so, but I wanted you to see something right here. Well, for, first of all, I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and, and, and screenshot this and I'm going to pick it up a little bit for you because I want you to see this word right here. Because really and truly this, I don't, I've shared stories before. This, this is the word I want you looking at right there. Boom, singleness. I've shared this story before how like whenever I first went to cross and place over in Franklin, there was a particular guy that was going to church there and he, he seemed like he was genuine enough. But one of the comments that he made to me after one of the Sunday school classes was he said, you know, Matt, I like the way the other preacher does it because he colors everything in crayon. And like I can understand because I'm about like at the level of a third grade. It was to be honest with you, the guy was nice. If I said his name, many of y'all would know him and I'm sure you liked him. But it, was a, it wasn't true humility. I could tell it wasn't. And, and basically what he was doing was he, was he was saying that he didn't understand it. But I want to encourage you that sometimes there's things in the Word of God that we don't always understand on the front end. And it doesn't mean that, that, it, that it's because we're teaching above people's heads or that we're preaching above people's heads. It's just what you need to understand is that the idea of simplicity in this verse doesn't mean simple like a third grader. It means singleness of focus. In other words, what the apostle Paul was saying right here was this. He was saying, I am fearful or I am concerned or what is the word? I fear in the strong, in the King James version. I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve through his subtlety, his trickery, your minds could be corrupted from the singleness, from the proper focus that is in Christ Jesus. The idea is this, is that your faith is in Christ. Our faith is in, is in the Lord. Our faith is in the work of God. And no matter how you dissect the word of God, whether it be Old Testament, New Testament, whether it be the letters of the apostles and what they wrote, whether it be narrative language, it doesn't matter what it is. When you keep pulling the layers back, you're going to keep finding Jesus Christ and the plan of God within every page of scripture. So I just need you to understand that. It's not just that it's a, yes, it's a simple message. A child can understand it. We know that, right? All a, all a child has to know is that, there, is that there's, uh, you know, that there's a thing called sin and that God sent his son Jesus to die, but that's not what this word means, so I want you to understand that. 
Um, because look, let me just say this. I'm going to use this word right here because it's an easy word. It's not used too many times in the New Testament right here. Three times in the New Testament. Well, in this particular one, look at, look at this. This is, this is Peter writing. This is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. Going up a little bit, this is what, this is what Peter says about Paul. He says this. He says, uh, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, talking about the new life, the kingdom of God, right? Be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Now, I just, I just want to try to ask you a question right there. Do you think that you're going to make your own self blameless in the eyes of God? And listen, even whenever we're talking about he's coming back for a bride that's without spot or wrinkle. Do you, do you think that you, in your walk with God, as you draw closer to God in your own strength, or you, that you're cleaning yourself up to the point that you are going to be without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, amen? Uh, let's just go ahead and make sure that, you know, we're not no venturing around. Okay, cool. Somebody. Anyway, that you are without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, that you will have produced that in your own self. Okay, I hope y'all following what I'm trying to say? If the Lord's coming back for a bride that's without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, do we think that we're going, that we're accomplishing that? I mean, some people probably do think that, right? Because they desire to be consecrated to the Lord, right? And they'll even, they'll even say like, I mean, for instance, if you'll remember that movie, Fireproof, y'all remember that movie? Kirk, I thought it was a good movie. Kirk Cameron was struggling with, with lust and he was struggling with uh, pornography kind of thing. And so what did he do? He brought the computer outside, right? And he took a, a Louisville slugger to it and he beat that computer up. And you know, I used to fuss about that. Man, look, now what you gonna do when you go to Walmart, dude? You gonna pluck your eyes? eyeballs out? Well, guess what though? You think that God isn't going to honor to some extent a person's desire if that's where they are with God. But what I'm trying to say is that's not going to, just because you beat up your computer with a Louisville slugger, that's not going to make you blameless without spot or wrinkle until the coming of the Lord. So I'm trying to explain to you this concept of righteousness real quick. We're about to get into some, some other scripture, but I want you to understand that righteousness is not of you or me. Righteousness is of Christ. Now, when we put our faith in Christ and we are now clothed with his righteousness, our right standing in the eyes of the Father, now we can have a right relationship with God based on the righteousness of Jesus. And if we understand how to continue to submit to the will of God, he will be cleansing us. And listen, I'm not just talking about the old stuff that used, to, that used to vex you. Whatever that old stuff was that you used to do with your favorite little thing when you was in the world. I'm talking about all kind of stuff can be on the inside of your heart, my friend. I'm talking about envy. I'm talking about jealousy. I'm talking about lying. I'm talking about a gossip spirit. I'm talking about a religious spirit. I'm talking about a critical spirit. It's like pus. It's like pus on the inside and the interior. Nobody likes to talk about it, but you poke it, and then all of a sudden it just comes oozing out. It's like a nasty old festered sore, and it tries to hide itself. But look, you hit somebody with the right thing, and it just comes all out. And it's like, whoa, I never even knew that that was there. What? See, God is wanting to cleanse us and to change us. And I'm here to tell you tonight that he's already done it when he did it at the cross, but we're going to go ahead and break it down. Amen. So look, but I want, let me, let me finish what I wanted to tell you here. He says, be diligent that you may be found in him without spot and blameless. Look, and, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Look, even as our beloved brother, Paul, also, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. The idea there is to wrestle. They're fighting unlearned people when they sometimes hear the right. Do you realize that there's factions that call themselves Christians that want to get rid of Paul's writings? And let me tell you why they want to do that. Because people love works. And people love that if they do more and more works, that they be recognized for their works. 
And whenever they're recognized for their works, guess what? It builds them up. They don't even always realize that that thing's in them. But whenever you understand that it's, all, it's the Lord's work, it brings humility. And also it brings a power of cleansing on the inside of you. But when people don't understand because they're unlearned, they rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So the main point I'm trying to make to you is this about that simplicity word. It's not just Jesus loves me, this I know because the Bible tells me so. Yes, that's fine for a third grader. But no, as we grow in Christ, we move on from sipping milk to eating meat. And, and, and that's how we grow in our understanding of the word of God. Amen. All right. So going back to where we were, he conquered spirits. Look, this real quick, I'm going to be talking about Coloss uh, the book of Colossians a little bit. I'm not going to overdo these maps, and you may not even be able to see it real well. I just think it's interesting. Look, here's Jerusalem over here, and this is the Mediterranean Sea. Look, this is where Paul was from. It was a Roman city. He was from the city of Tarsus. Here's Colossae right here. Laodicea is somewhere right around here. There'll be another map that shows it. And you can see Galatia, Philippi, Thessalonica. Look. Corinth is over here. The Apostle Paul's riding in a boat going to all these different cities, establishing churches, writing letters to them, doing ministries, casting out devils, seeing the sick healed, but preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. The people that are plagued by demonic spirits. You need to understand that. We're going to get into this a little bit more. Look, so here's another. Here's Laodicea. I wanted you to see that. Here's Rome. You see Rome. And look, one of the things I want you to know is that if you see my map right here, but if we went even further off to the east, what we would begin to realize is that, let me see here, if I can do this, let me get me a blank sheet. So if this is, if this is, is, is Italy over here, y'all just bear with me a second because I want to make a point. I've established some of these things in the past and I want to try and establish it again, is that if this is, if this is Italy and this would be Corinth, something like that. And here's the, I think, the Aegean Sea. And here's a Asia Minor here. And then this would be where Jerusalem or Israel starts. This is the Sea of Galilee and the, and the Jordan River. And then over here would be, I can't even, I've, I've run out of room. But this would be the Tigris and the Euphrates. Look at this right here, the Tower of Babel. Why are you doing this, preacher? Because I want, you, I want to remind you of some things I've taught you before. At the Tower of Babel, we are under the impression, I hope you're, you understand this by now, and if you don't, I'm going to introduce it to you, that at the Tower of Babel, when they were building a tower to reach into the heavens, they weren't talking about a linear tower to reach into the atmosphere where God is located. This is demonic activity. These are men and women that are using the free will given to them to engage demonic spirits in order to have power on earth. And I got to tell you that this very thing is still continuing even into this day. So whenever God confused the languages, what happened from Tower of Babel, they settled into the region of Canaan. Right. If I drew another little something here, that would be Egypt down here. That'd be the Nile. Look, they left ba they left the area of Babel, which is actually modern day Iraq. They settled into Canaan. They went east to India, to China. They came over here in Asia Minor. This is about where Colossae is. They came over here to Corinth. They made their way to Rome. And if you do any kind of studies about false gods, look, even the apostle Paul in the area of Corinth and Athens would be up in this area. When he went and preached on Mars Hill, he said, you people are so superstitious. He said, you got a statue to every God. And he said, you know, what I want to talk to you about, I want to talk to you about the unknown God. You got a statue to unknown God. I, you know what? He's the one I want to talk to you about. Let me tell you about him because he was resurrected from the dead. And he begins to say in the midst of that message that people are groping around. The idea is that they're looking, they're blind and they're looking and they're feverishly searching for something that would be real. And, and, these, and I want you to know that these false gods have been here from the get-go. 
Whenever, look, whenever God created Adam and Eve, the serpent that was in the garden, you do understand he is a fallen angel. And you do understand that when Adam and Eve gave into that, that the entire world is under the, the, the rebellion of these spiritual entities. Look, churches don't want to talk about this kind of stuff because they feel like it's, it's kind of like it, it gives them the eebie-jeebies. It's kind of creepy. But, but no, it's the word of God. And the word of God teaches us that we are in a spiritual battle. And so that's what I'm kind of wanting to talk to you about a little bit uh, tonight as we, as we move forward. Here's just another picture of, um, you know, this shows you all the churches of Asia Minor. But look at this, this scripture right here. He said, well, I'm not scripture. This is one of the points. The main point today is teaching. This teaching surrounds the thought of spiritual victory, specifically victory over spirits. Look, Sometimes people need deliverance and whenever that vessel that's holding that demon spirit wants to be free and they begin to cry out to God, God will minister. He will show up and he will bring deliverance. Sometimes people don't want to be delivered just yet, but if they hang around long enough and they begin to cry, whether they realize it or not, look, even the demon spirits are subject to him. Even demon spirits will get on their knees and they will start to worship him. They will even lift their hands to give him glory because he is the king of glory and they have no choice in that. And I just believe that when a vessel is hurting and begins to even cry out, that, that something's happening on the interior of that person. And if they hang around the presence of God long enough, I'm telling you, God's going to show up and he'll bring freedom and liberty in their heart and in their lives. Now, I've been watching a video series called Vexed. Uh, Cimarron actually had told me about it. I asked Danielle to put it on our, our Facebook or wherever we put stuff. And I've been watching this. Uh, you never did put it. Okay, I asked her to. I was supposed to give her a little disclaimer, and I never did. My fault. But we're going to put it up there. And it's a large series. But look, you know what I'm realizing as I watch this? I'm realizing that the people of God, many times, whether they realize it or not, are allowing their own selves to be vexed. Whenever we open up doors, we don't realize it at first. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. But no, no, it is a big deal. Because if you're vexed by a lion's spirit, it's a big deal. If you're vexed by a gossip spirit, it's a big deal. And I'm not going to get into all that because I don't want to spend all my time on it. If you're vexed by a spirit of lust, it's a big deal. If you're vexed by a spirit of addiction, whether it be heroin or cocaine or whatever it is, if you're vexed by a spirit of alcoholism, it's a big deal because it's holding you in bondage. And the longer that we toy around with these things, even as believers, the deeper they're trying to gain access and, and, oh, but a Christian can't be possessed. Hold on a second. I'm just trying to make a point. I'm making a point that you don't think you can be vexed by demonic spirits. You don't think that the apostle Paul himself, and there's a difference between the spirit and the soul of a man. I and mean, we're not getting into all that right now, but I'm just trying to make a point. I've been teaching that for years. There's a difference between the spirit and the soul of a man. And, and look, you're going to tell me that when a person that loves God, but yet something tells them, they, and look, I'm talking about born again and tells them to, to, and, and has control over them and, and, and says, you're going to go do this, and they go do it, even though they don't want to do it, that that's not some kind of demonic oppression, vexation, whatever you want to call it. No, it is. And, and, there, and listen, it's happening to people more than what we realize. Anger. Oh, we don't ever want to put those things in the same book. But look, do you realize that sometimes anger is literally demonic? Have you ever experienced wrath before? The spirit of wrath is not just your regular just get mad at something. No, the spirit of wrath is uncontrollable anger that you have no control over. And it will take over you and your mouth will not. You can't even shut your mouth when that's happening. Come on, somebody. You can't even shut your mouth. Oh, no, let me back up. I can't even shut my mouth whenever that thing tries to rise up. Okay, that's different. Like, I should be able to be in control of my spirit uh, because the Lord has died to set me free. <laughs> and so if somebody wants to argue with me and I catch on to this feeling of lack of peace on the inside and the Holy Spirit's right, I'm, I've been in this long enough to know. Okay, whenever the Holy Spirit starts saying, Matt, what you doing? 
You know, and what I'll try to do when I realize it's happening is I'll try to talk to the other person. I'll try to say, hey, look, let's start over. Let, let's, let's try to start over because, look, and, and, it's, and it definitely isn't all you. Look, I'm the pastor, but can I admit to you that I made a boo-boo too and that, and that I can help to escalate this? Let's, let's bring this down. But what I'm trying to say is, is that when we can't control that, that is not the Holy Spirit doing that. And it's not even just my flesh. That's like a, that's a demonic entity that's trying to cause division and disunity and strife and confusion, right? Okay, I hope that makes sense. All right. So look, in the book of, in the letter to the Colossians, and we're about to get into a little bit of Romans before we go back to Colossians, but in the letter to Colossians, there was some weird stuff going on. And in Paul's letters, I have noticed that he kind of attacks this mysticism and, and this occultic aspect. It was going on all over the place, but he really kind of singles it out in the letter to the Colossians. And there's a mixture of angel worship. Look, I'm all about God dispatching angels, my friend. <laughs> if he dispatched angels to minister to Jesus whenever he was in the wilderness being tempted of the devil, if the Lord see fit to send some angels my way, I'm all about it. But I don't want to be so focused on angels that I can't stay focused on the Lord, on the Holy Spirit, on the finished work of Christ. But at the same time, I pray that. So, Lord, dispatch your warring angels, oh, Lord God. The Holy Spirit, breathe fresh and anew on this situation. Bring victory. Let your power amen show up in this situation but there was a mixture of angel worship mysticism turned into asceticism yeah, I may I may I don't make fun of her but I talk about how in the because my sister-in-law is from the Philippines and I, I already knew this before but I, I knew this before I met her because I'd see it on television I didn't know she was right there I'd see her I'd see it on television where every year this dude you may not have seen it for for resurrection that he will they will I think they did, did they whoop him they all whooped themselves it's called it's called flagellate and, and they beat themselves with like a cat of nine tails as they walk down the road and their backs are bloody. And then they got this one dude, I think the old guy might have retired, they got a new guy. And every year they crucify him. They nail him to a cross near the ocean. And then once they pull the nails out, he jumps in the ocean and it's 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 in the ocean. Like that. And look, that same spirit, he'll hide himself. He doesn't always want to be all out front and whatever, because he sometimes they like to just hide. Okay. And and the root the reality of it is is that sometimes when we live a life of Christianity according to rules, regulations, whenever our Christianity is a works-based message, whenever we start, to, when our faith is in works instead of in Christ, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we move forward in tonight, but whenever we begin to do that without us realizing it, we're, we're creating a, we'll start to puff ourselves up. We start to get puffed up and we, and we, without realizing it, it's no longer the righteousness of the Lord that we're submitting ourselves under. Instead, without realizing it, we're kind of like, we're making our own self-righteousness. We're ma and, and look, dude, when you don't know any better, it kind of like sounds good and it looks good, but it's not good because it's not the right faith. And I hope that makes some sense. So there's a couple of, I want to talk to you about this word principles, or principality. So real quick in, in Hebrews chapter five, and I just, wanted, I just want you to see these, this word because it's a big word. I'm gonna try to slow down. You know how that probably won't work that well, but I'm gonna try because I want you to be able to get some of this, right? So look at this. It says, for when the time you ought to be teachers. Now this is, y'all understand the context of the letter of the Hebrew to the Hebrews, right? These are, these are people that are likely living in the area of Jerusalem, and these are specifically Jewish converts that have converted over to Christianity. We know through church history that they were persecuted horrendously. Like, if any one of y'all has started watching the Chosen series, in the Chosen, Matthew, look, this dude's pretty sharp. He knows what he's, he's doing. He's showing us little pieces. Matthew's father basically made a comment that he was going to have like a funeral. He was going to mourn him for seven days. And they, they literally did that kind of thing. If their, if their son converted over to Christianity, they would literally have a funeral service for him saying that he was dead. 
Okay, these are the kinds of things that's happening to these people as they have chosen to live for the Lord. Now, during the book of Hebrews, the, the temple was still erected. They were still doing animal sacrifices. And so now they're being tempted to go back to their old way of living. Now, the Jewish people are different than any other people that have ever lived on the face of the earth. Well, what are you talking about? Their former way of living is actually the religion of the one true God, but now he's manifest himself in his son. So if they choose to go back to their old religion, they're not really serving God anymore. They're just no different than a pagan cult because they're not serving the one whom God sent. But so for them to go backwards to their previous life means to go back to their old religion. But for you and I to go backwards, it probably looks like something a whole lot different, right? All right, but I want you to see, he says, now you ought to be teachers, but you have need that one teach you. Again, which would be the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. All right, so I want you to see that, these, uh, that, that, that some of these, um, there was a particular specific scripture that I wanted you to see. Okay, so they, look, look, he goes on to say this, and it's the same word, principles. You see this word, principles and principalities, right? Therefore, leaving the principles. Now, I didn't plan on teaching this passage, but sometimes people get really squirrely with this. They, they get thrown off is what I'm trying to say. It says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. So they, automatic, so they automatically think that these things, we're not supposed to teach this anymore in the church because they're connecting it to New Testament truth. I hope I'm not losing y'all. He says, therefore, leaving the principles of the, first of all, I want you to know the word principle means it's the beginning. It's the first order of things. Many times the word principle in and of itself simply means the first order or the arrangement of things. So what this is talking about, let me just go ahead and let the cat out the bag. It's not talking about Christian theology as we know it today based on the scriptures. It's talking about Old Testament types that pointed to Jesus that would come. All right. Well, look, look, look what it's saying. Let us go on unto perfection, meaning let's go to ma towards maturity in Christ, not laying again, look at this, the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Well, wait, hold on a second. You want me to, you don't want me to teach repentance from dead works? Uh, author of Hebrews, you don't want me to teach faith towards God? You, you don't want me to teach the doctrine of, you don't want me to baptize people anymore? You, you don't want me to lay, ha lay hands on people? You, you, you don't want me to talk about the resurrection of the dead or of eternal judgment? That's not what it's saying. But when you don't know, so look, I'm glad you were here tonight because the next time somebody tries to, because this is what they used to tell me when I tried to talk about the cross, they say, oh, no, 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 we got to leave the principles. The, we got to leave the, the elementary things behind and we got to move on. This is talking about Old Testament stuff. Look, the doctrine of baptism, the word baptism is, we're, we're confused. It means, that, do you understand they had ceremonial washings in the Old Testament that are not the same as baptism? It was rituals of cleansing. They would burn the whole red heifer and take its ashes and make ceremonial water to cleanse people. That's what the word literally means. It, it's talking about ceremonial cleansing. It's just that the English word baptism fits the picture, but it causes us confusion because when we think of baptism, we think of water baptism. Does that make sense? Of the laying on of hands. In the Old Testament, they laid hands on the animal and transferred their guilt to it to cut its throat. So they were transferring guilt. We don't do that anymore because Jesus already took our guilt upon him when he went to the cross. A resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees believed that there was a resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe there was a resurrection. And they're over here fighting about this through the years. That's what that's talking about. And of eternal judgment. But the main point that I wanted you to see is the word principles. And I wanted you to understand that the word principles means the beginning or a certain, or the, the early arranged order of things. So when he's saying about this, he's saying the previous arranged order of how God revealed himself to mankind through the Old Testament. We got to leave that. Now, we, it's not that we don't teach it. It's not that we don't find the types of Christ in there, but we're not living according to the law because Jesus fulfilled the law. 
So we're leaving behind the first order of arranged teachings that spoke about the Christ, the anointed one. That's what it word, the word means. That spoke about the one that was to come. And now we're going to move into perfection, which is the revelation of the things having to do with Jesus, right? So look at this next scripture. You got Galatians 4, 3. I'm not even going to go to that. Let's go for sake of time. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, okay? So here we go. This is this word principles again. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Now look, this is another cool little thing about this app. You may not be able to see it, but when I click on principalities, and it says it, look, you may not be able to read it. I'm not going to take the time to just trust me on this. It says the beginning, the origin. It talks about, uh, uh, you know, the beginning of something. It talks about having to do with, you know, authorities. And, but it's talking about the original or the beginning or, or origin. But look, when I click on this, look at this. I can scroll up and I can show you every time this Greek word is used. And even though you can't read it off to the side, I'm just going to tell you the English word used. Beginning, 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 multiple times. Beginning, magistrates, beginning, 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 okay? Beginning, uh, sometimes the word corners, uh, first, the word first, principality, principalities, principalities, beginning, beginning. You get it? So it's beginning. It's a, the beginning stage of something. And so whenever he says right here, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What you and I need to understand is the reason I showed you the Tower of Babel or tried to draw you a picture is that these things been here from the get go. This is the original. No, it's not uh, doesn't usurp God's originality. God was the first. God's the one that met with Adam and Eve in the garden. God's the one that had a relationship with them. But when they fell into sin, they invited these, these spirits, this first order of, because look, they fell before the fall of man. Y'all realize that, right? The fallen entities fell before God ever created mankind. And as soon as mankind was here, guess what? They started to tinker around with the new human creation, trying to entice them, trying to tempt them to go in a way. And this is the first order of things. Spiritually speaking, fallen man has been dealing with demonic spirits, with fallen angels, with evil orders, trying to teach mankind. And we're about to get into that. I'm about to prove it to you in the scripture, trying to teach mankind their own doctrines, their own way to do things. Put your faith in your works. It's, and he, they constantly, back in the day, they might like say, lift a, make a statue and worship this statue. And they still do that in some places. But any way that a demonic spirit can get you or I to get off the right trail and to get our eyes off of Jesus and to put it on something else, those demon spirits are going to try to do that. And they're going to try to get us to fall to the traditions of men. They're going to get us to try to fall to the teachings of other human beings. And most of the time, the stuff they say, it sounds right, but it's not right. Okay. And so I wanted you to, to see that there. All right. So we're going to get into this a little bit real quick. This is Romans chapter four, verse one. Now, I just want to point out some things because look, number one, I want you to see this. Abraham believed God. You see that down there? Look, Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. It doesn't say, look, look what it says. What shall we say then was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to his flesh. Now, do, you do understand this, that the word flesh, I hope you can stay with me. I'm trying to keep you awake. Uh, it's kind of hard sometimes, but that's okay. Look, it's okay, sis. You can take a nap. That's fine. Look, I just want you to understand something, though. Look, the word flesh, sometimes it can describe physical birth physical birth. You understand that Jesus was born in the flesh. Jesus was born of a woman, but Jesus's flesh was different than our flesh. Jesus had no sin in his flesh. So, so the word flesh can mean a physical birth or a natural birth. The word flesh can also mean the sinful part of man, his sinful 
aspect because sometimes it's actually translated that way in the NIV. The sinful nature is translated into where the King James has flesh. It has sinful nature. But then in three, look, it's your will, your will, your wisdom, your plan. You understand your plan. Does that make sense? So whenever we're talking about uh, Abraham and he had a plan, what was his plan? Well, look, Sarah, if you don't mind, or Sarah had the plan and Abraham agreed to it. Look, Abraham, I'm, I'm 90, you're 99, come on. It, or maybe a few years before that, it ain't gonna happen. You go ahead and go lie with Hagar and look, we'll produce seed, all right? It was a plan. God had promised him a seed. They kind of did that thing back in the day. That's what they kind of did. So what they're doing is they're taking matters into their own hands, trying to bring the will of God to pass. You know how many times Christians do that? That we try to take matters into our own hands to bring the will of God to pass. It will result in heartache. It will result in disaster, my friend. Okay. And God never told us to do that. And so whenever it happens, let's not get mad at God, right? And so, you know, look, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to get off of that quite yet. So, but look, so we got, we got the, the flesh. So look, so, so the flesh will try to get you to, the flesh will try to get you to, to, to do, to, to move towards works. Now, whenever we're talking about works, now look, works are a beautiful thing. Whenever you, whenever you go to work for God and you're spending time in prayer and you're spending time in reading the word of God and you're spending time in going to church and you're spending time teaching the kids and you're spending time going out on the street and witnessing Jesus and you're spending time praying in your prayer closet for other believers that God has put on your heart. These are the things that Christians do. We're supposed to do work. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to turn to it, but James said, you, you say that you have faith, but you have no works. Oh, no, no, no. He said, I'm going to show you my word, my faith through my words. The word of God is not contradicting itself. James is trying to say, if you got true faith, we ought to see some works. Paul's saying, Bill, you're not saved by your works. Because, no, you're saved by the work of the Lord. <laughs> and that's what gives salvation. And, and real quick, while we're, we're, we're right here, but look, let me go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, so that you understand what I'm trying to get at. This, look at this. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk ye in him. Let me ask you a question as I go ahead and lift this up for you a little bit. How did you, how, uh, you can't see the whole word, but how did you receive him? Faith, Faith right? Now, I don't have time to break all the way down and give you John eight fifty six. I don't have time to give you Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. But I will tell you that Abraham, the Bible says that because God foreknew that he would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel in advance to Abraham. <laughs> and, and look, and, 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 the, and the Jews came against Abraham, came against Jesus, and Jesus, they said, you, you know, we serve our father Abraham. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And then he said this, Abraham saw my day. He saw it and he rejoiced. How in the world did Abraham see your day, Lord? Now, guaranteed, this is some of my commentary, okay, or some of the things that I feel like the Lord has shown me because you can't find it exactly like this in the Bible, and I know you all heard me say it before, but how in the world are you going to tell me that when God told him, take your son, your only son, yeah, I'd sit on that for a little bit because he had two, but anyway, he didn't recognize the one that Abraham produced in the flesh, the supernatural birth a type of the supernatural birth that would later come is the one that God recognized. Take that son of your supernatural. Come on, Father Abraham, Father, Son. Come on, Father Abraham, take your son, your only son, and bring him upon a mountain that I will show you. And so the Bible says that Abraham laid wood on the lad's back. And so the lad carried wood up the mountain, and then God provided a sacrifice. Amen? God provided a sacrifice. And, and Abraham didn't have to kill his own son because the truth of the matter is that God planned to offer his son 2,000 years later as a sacrifice. And so I wanted to just try to make the point that this, the same way you received him through faith, through faith in what? through faith in the promise of God, which was Jesus, 
which was Jesus dying on the cross, is the same way you continue to walk in him. So if you and I want to see victory in our heart and in our lives, we need to understand what is the object of our faith. Have you ever thought of that before? Some of you may have. And I'm not going to get too deep into it right this second, but I just want you to think about that. The object of faith. What am I believing whenever I'm saying I believe God? What am I believing when I say I have faith in God? Do I have faith in the power of God? Absolutely. Okay, well, let's just, let's just keep going for now. So, but flesh will try to get you to focus on your works. Right. So what ends up happening is it, now it becomes my prayer, right? Hold on. You're going to get my point. My gift. My ministry. My calling. My study. <laughs> and all of these things are true in a sense. It's really all about focus. How am I seeing what I do for God what kind of a lens am I looking through? Am I thinking that God's moving in my life because, because of my study, because of my prayer? Because I gotta be honest with you, you didn't just wake up one day out of nowhere and decide that you was gonna be a servant of the Lord. And yes, if God is giving grace to you to read your Bible, giving grace to you to pray, giving grace to you to go to, to church, giving grace, if he poured out gifts of the spirit upon you, right? To, to be used for his glory, to, to minister to his people. And that's one of the things that I've come to the realization. I mean, I'm not trying to get weird on you, but we've been praying for a long time for the gifts of the spirit. And at some point in time, I just started changing the way I pray. I was like, all right, Lord, source send some people or pour it out on other people. Because guess what? If my gift is to teach, but right now I'm not operating in a gift of whatever, then do I have to have all the gifts? Or, I mean, if he wants to give them to me, I'm all open, Lord. But maybe God don't want to, look, you may not agree with this and that's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. Maybe God doesn't want to give me a whole bunch of other gifts because he thinks, like, you, you already got some issues, son. You, you, sometimes the way your head is thinking, I'm trying to correct. And he, listen, he's doing it to you too. I'm just being honest about it. Okay, he's doing it to all of us. He's trying to correct all of us. We get puffed up like the, the apostle Paul got puffed up. God had to stick a thorn in my side, Paul said, because of the abundant revelations. And had he not given me a thorn in my side, I'd have been puffed up with pride. So the Lord and I said, Lord, take this thing from me three different times. The Lord said, no. Why? Because my grace is sufficient for you. So if I'm over here crying out, Lord, send gifts, send gifts, and then he doesn't. And my, if my heart is really that God's people be ministered to, and he sends other people, he starts giving gifts to you. What am I going to do? Am I going to have like a little sorrow party for my, y'all are operating in the cool gifts and, you know, whatever. I don't know. I mean, that kind of stuff can happen in people's head, right? Can it not? And that's why I was just saying, like, I, you know, I don't even know if any, and I'm not trying to point stuff out, but like, whenever, now that we're having more movement at the altar, it's kind of like, I know that I've been called to pray for people. As a pastor, I pray for people. But I'm just going to be real with you. If you see me, if Brother Kirk comes up, I'm just being, and this is what I'm thinking in my mind, so you know. If Brother Kirk comes up, I know Brother Kirk is operating in a gift more powerfully, I've operated in a gift of a word of wisdom before. I've operated in a gift of a word of knowledge, but I know that he's operating in that gift more powerfully. And as I've prayed for someone, and if I see him feeling led to come and pray for someone, you may see me say, yeah, brother, get up there. Because you know what? He may have a word for you. And I want you to be able to receive a word. Or Sister Brenda may have, or somebody else, Edwina might have a word to give to Brenda. You get the point. It's about God's people and God wanting to minister to his people so that we can all be built up and edified so that we can do the work of the ministry so that more souls can be saved, so that more disciples can be made, so that more seed can be sown, so that more people can be saved, so that more disciples can be made. Does that make sense? Because we're doing work for him. Amen. Amen. So, but if it starts to get into the point where it's about my prayer, my gift, my ministry, my calling, my study, see, it's about focus. And then guess what? You start to get where, well, 
You ought not be that way. You ought not. What? You're thinking more highly of yourself than what you ought. That's what the Word of God says. Don't go sitting in Moses' seat. We were talking about that earlier. Some people want to, I'm sitting in the seat of Moses. You know, and then they got, you're going to be embarrassed because they might tell you you don't belong in that seat. You need to go take a seat on the front row. But instead, sit on the, sit on the front row, sit in the back. And if they invite you to come up, then now you've been given honor instead of being desecrated because anyway, you get the point. So Abraham didn't gain anything through works of the flesh. No, look what it says. He believed God. He believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So Abraham believed God and righteousness was given. And look, if you look at this word counted, you know what it means? It means to literally be put into the account. When you got, so right now what we're talking about is saving faith. Saving faith. Abraham believed God and he was given righteousness. You do understand that that's a big concept of salvation, that now your guilt has been taken away and you've been given the righteousness of Jesus. So now you can have a relationship with God and you can have access into the presence of God. Do we understand that if it wouldn't have been for Jesus taking his sinless life and offering it on the cross, that you and I would still be dead and guilty in our sin? sin and we would not be able to have access into the presence of God. And where the presence of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. There is power. There is potential. Now, God don't want it just to be potential. I can tell you, he wants it to be kinetic. God wants his energy to be kinetic. He wants it to be moving. He wants it to be affecting things and changing things in the spiritual realm. Because look, if Abraham would have done it through works, he'd have had something to boast about. But he ain't got nothing to boast about because he didn't do it through works. He, did, he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, I would like to say this real quick before we move on. This word justified. Many of you are already aware of this. This word, look, so if righteousness, if I had to give a word for righteousness, what it means, it's a standing. So what, what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that before you knew Jesus, your standing was guilty. You understand that? Born of Adam, you didn't have a relationship with God. I don't care. Look, they didn't come in here and say whatever they wanted. That's not consistent with the Bible. You were born in sin like your father, Adam. That's why you must be born again in Christ. And when you put your faith in Christ, there's a transference that takes place. He took your guilt and he gave you his righteousness. And so that's how, so, so your righteousness now, if you're in Christ, if you've believed, that's why, you know, look, that's why we don't have to be thinking about sin all the time because we're not under the, but sin is still the, is still a problem. It's still the thing that's going to trip you up if you open up the door to it. If you go that way and you let it have its way, it will bring you backwards instead of forward, right? And, and so, but look, so if righteousness is a standing, then guess what? Justified is the declaration. In other words, it's the way God sees you and he says it. If you look it up in the word, if you look it up in the strongs, the word justification has to do with a declaration. God is saying you're righteous. Because guess what? You by listen, he gave each and every one of us a measure of faith. He gave each and every one of us a free will. And he's asking us to take the free will and to choose his plan. His plan was to create a nation through which he would give us Jesus. And then he allowed Jesus and his sinlessness to die on the cross for our sin. And when we accept that, it's pleasing to him because we're agreeing with his plan. And now he gives us the gift of righteousness. And now that we have righteousness, we can boldly enter the throne room of grace through the veil, which is his flesh. Jesus died. His flesh was ripped so that you and I could enter into the holy of holies, which is where the presence of God dwells. That's a beautiful thing. We don't have to feel slighted. We don't have to feel less than. We can enter into the holy of holies. Amen? All right. So, uh, move, well, I don't know what happened there. All right. Look, let's read this right here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. It says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. 
Okay, because I'm about to transition. I want to talk a little bit more about this spiritual stuff, about those principalities and all of that kind of stuff that I introduced you to on the front end. You, you and I, before Christ, we were dead in trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Before we were Christians, we walked in sin. We had sex with people we wasn't supposed to have sex with because we weren't married in the eyes of God. We drank stuff that changed our, the way we acted. And we didn't act like believers. We, 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 some of us did drugs and we didn't act like believers. And, and we gossiped and we lied and we, 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 we did things we weren't supposed to do. But now in Christ, right, we, we, what we were dead and we, we used to walk the course of the world. See, the world is walking a course. That's where Jesus talked in Matthew chapter 7, I believe it's verse 24. He says, wide is the, is the path, right? I'm, I'm, wide is the path. Wide is the gate. Many will travel that pathway that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path. Narrow is the way in to, to get into righteousness. Because people are thinking that they're living okay, but not according to the word of God, right? And so you used to walk and you followed the course of the world and look what you were following, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. I could show you tons of scripture that talk about that, but what I need you to understand is this. This is the first order. This is the principalities. This is the powers that have affected human beings through false doctrines, false teachings about false gods. And even it has filtered in. Look, the Catholic Church is not even Christianity. If you came here tonight and you thought that, I'm so sorry that I had to say it so bluntly, but it just is not even close to true Christianity. It's Babylonian mystery religion. It is what it is. People used to fuss. They don't want to say it anymore. They just rather let people flounder in all of that. It is Babylonian mystery religion. It is full of falsities. Okay, it is what it is. No, when they say the immaculate conception, they're not even talking about Jesus, my friend. Do your search. They're talking about Mary. They're trying to say Mary was born of a virgin. Mary was born without sin. Mary was a sinless one. Okay, and they try to say Mary ascended into heaven. This is not true. It's not true. And, and, and look, there's other things that we could talk about, but I, but I want you to see in Protestantism, there, look, do we, look, y'all think that false prophets is just David Koresh? <laughs> y'all, no, really, I mean, I know that y'all think false prophets is just, um, is just uh, Jim Jones, drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> they, have, they do have people out there that are accusing y'all of drinking Kool-Aid, by the way. Do you, do you think that false prophets are, you know, you get the point that I'm trying to make. Or do we think that false prophets could be, and I'm not trying to sit here and get a, have a witch burning, because I'm, look, I, by, the, by the grace of God, he gave me the gift of discerning of spirits. And there's some things that I have been very apprehensive to call it like I have ended up seeing it. After, listen, if when I make comments about that is not that is not a Holy Spirit anointing right there. That is a demonic anointing. You think that there's, that there's not a such thing as a demonic anointing? Oh, yeah, I can guarantee you. The Antichrist is going to have it. Hitler had it. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Obama, Obama had it. It affected me. It affected me the first time I saw that man speak on TV for that Democratic National Convention. When he started to speak those eloquent words, and I was like, ooh, where'd this dude come from? I was so impressed. That is, he ain't from the Holy Ghost. I wish he would be. I hope that is that he'd get saved, but, he, but he's operating under another spirit. And I got to tell you that there are famous people that stand behind pulpits on television that are operating under a demonic spirit. And it's not the Holy Spirit. And it's leading people astray. All right. So I'm just going to move on because, look, I wanted to get to, get to some, some things. Let, let, let me just read this to you. I thought this was, I felt like the Lord was, was giving me some of this. Look, faith in his cross produces the same work in me. Okay. What did it, in other words, it produces the same work in me that it produced in him. Faith in his cross produces the same work in me. What are you talking about, preacher? In him, the sinless one died. His death was accepted by God for my sin. My faith in his death allows God to see my old man dead, allows God to see my new man resurrected. Okay? I know you're probably going to have to chew on that for a while, but look. 
Let me just show you this, too. I don't even know if I can do this right the way that this is, but I'm probably spending way too much time on this. I'm not going to be able to do it. Well, maybe I can. Yeah, look at this. You know one time I heard Bob Cornell speak, preaching at a, a, a camp meeting, and you know what he said? His cross is my cross. I had never heard anybody say that before. His cross is my cross. Where he died through faith, I also, my old man dies. Where he resurrected in, 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 in glory, my new man resurrects in him through faith. Look, the old, the, the old way of things being done was that, look, you know, the old man, the old man or, or, or the cross, look at this, the cross brings death, right? In other words, the cross is an instrument of death, is it not? Right? And the spirit brings life. I was going to turn to all these different scriptures, but just but for the sake of time, just bear with me. So look, the cross brings death to the old man, right? And the, and the spirit brings life to the new man. Yeah. Amen? And look, at the same spirit, we used to sing this in the old church. At the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, dwell in you, dwell in you. I don't know the rest of the words, but you get the point. I get excited when I hear it, man. That that same spirit, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, let the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it will also quicken your mortal body. The Holy Spirit will allow the, the, the death side of Calvary. Lord, I understand. But see, because that's what I'm trying to talk to you about. I'm going to write on this board, even though it's so beautiful, Yvette, you, did, you got a beautiful artwork. The old man is dead. A new man is resurrected. I now believe this. This becomes the object of my faith. I am no longer bound by a spirit of lust. In the name of Jesus, I am no longer bound by addictions. In the name of Jesus, that old man is dead. You a lying devil. You a lying devil. I'm a new man in Christ. But if you don't understand these things, you start trying to put your faith in everything else under the sun. You try to put your faith in how much you rebuke the devil. I rebuke the devil. You start putting your faith in how much you pray. You start putting your faith in how much you go to church. You start putting your faith in how many ministries you're involved in. You start putting your faith in your works instead of his work. And your work ain't going to get it done, my friend. My work's not going to get it done, my friend. It's his work and faith in that. Look, that's part of the renewed mind. There is truth that in order to gain a renewed mind... We have to put God's word on the inside of us because it's a, I was talking to Josh earlier. I hadn't seen him in a while and we were having a great conversation. But one of the things that I was saying is this is what the Lord showed me. The word of God is a foreign language. Yeah. I'm trying to learn Spanish. I'm under, my, I'm, I'm under the understanding that Brother Kirk can speak fluent Spanish. I've been trying. Bill shared with me that he can speak Malay. I'm pretty sure it's pretty close to Chinese. That just blows me away. My point is, is that how? I don't know, but people learn. But you know, it ain't an easy thing. Even people that have the gift to learn other languages, there's still a time frame to understand it. You got to practice it. You got to utilize it. The word of God is a foreign language. It comes from another realm. The whole context and the whole, the, the love of God is foreign. You and I don't really understand the love of God until we start to understand God better. Does that make sense? And the better we understand God, the more we realize, I thought that I had a bunch of good love, but I don't know. I'm still wanting my, it's, I'm, what, what I get out of the deal, friend? You know, what, what you, what, what I'm going to get? And, and, and look what Jesus said. You, what you're going to get, you're going to get life. I'm going to take death, you're going to get life. That's, that's how, that's how we're going to work this deal. I'm going to come and I'm going to be your brother. I'm going to become you, f flesh and blood, because God can't die. I'm going to become you. I'm going to offer my sinless life for your, for, your, for your sinful life. And I'm going to die. And you're going to get life. That's a 
That's a really, really selfless form of love. Amen. Amen. Help us, right? I don't know about you, but help me. (laughs) Help me to learn how to love like that. And see, the Holy Spirit wants to produce that fruit in our heart. So as we stay dead, as a matter of fact, the old man dies in Christ, the spirit brings life. So look, with the, with the new man, what you got? You got fruit, right? The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, kindness, patience. But with the old man, what you get? Flesh, flesh. lust of the flesh, anger, malice, division, S-E-C-T-S, sex, meaning, you know, factions. Oh, did you hear what preacher, what the preacher said? Man, I know, you know, old boy been sitting in the back over there and I heard him preach one time. He'd be a much better pastor than such and such, you know, uh, you know, or, or whatever. You know, I, did you hear how, oh, girl, boy, look, I didn't know that girl had pipes like that, my friend. Maybe we, boy, look, we need to hire her to be the new whatever, whatever. Dude, look, this stuff is envy, jealousy, and guess what? If you poke somebody hard enough, you might see some pus oozing out of somebody. You might find out there's some symptoms of some things that was on the inside of them that you didn't know was there. And guess what? Can I tell you something? The reason I know so well about it, because I've not seen it in my own life. I've shared the story before. This was after the Lord was getting a hold of me and giving me understanding of the word of God. And I'm sitting there listening to Brad Bullock preach. And anybody that heard Brad Bullock preach before, whatever you think about him now, wherever you are, brother, y'all know good and well I can't preach better than that dude. Like the communication skills just ain't like that, okay? It just give props where props are due. Can I study it out? Do I understand some things and see some things that maybe he didn't and that I was able to? Yeah, that's a possibility, but I couldn't preach better than that dude. But while I'm sitting there in the audience and he's preaching and he's doing something, I'm like, hmm, I could do better than that. And then all of a sudden, the Lord said, did you see that? Did you? Shine the light. Come on, stop the service, everybody, right? Get the spotlight. Shine it on Matt's heart. Come on, everybody, stop what you're doing. Everybody look at Matt. At least that's what it felt like because the Lord showed me what was in me. That's envy. That's That's not right. That's a lust of the flesh. And look, the closer we get to the Lord, the more we begin to realize those things are there. It's a beautiful thing when the Lord begins to chastise us and teach us and show us and crucify the old man so that the fruit of the spirit of the new man can be produced. So the spirit brings life. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right. So with all that said, let me see if I can find the, really the scripture that I kind of wanted to talk to you about. Uh, so you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Amen. Amen. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And look at this. I'm just going to say a few things. And the uncircumcision of your flesh. So we've talked about some of these things before, but what do you think that it means in the New Testament when he says you were walking in the uncircumcision of your flesh? Do you think he means, you know, I'm not trying to be weird, but like what we do to a baby boy whenever we cut his foreskin off? That's not what he's talking about. Y'all do know that, right? We're talking about something spiritual. And we know other scriptures in the New Testament that talk about a circumcision of the heart. And so what we do understand is this, is that just in a sense of the way you cut flesh off in a physical circumcision, the Holy Spirit is is cutting flesh off the heart whenever we're yielding to the presence of God, right? And so how do you think that that happened? Like, I just want you to see right here where it says in the uncircumcision of your flesh, And when you hear circumcision of the heart, do you understand that that's really screaming the word cross to you right there? Because think about it. When you're removed, how else did did you get circumcised in your heart? Uh, Hello? Because if the flesh represents the old man and it's cut away and you become a new man, where did that event take place? When you put faith in Christ and you became one with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, and that God did a con- conversion? Did you understand these things when you got saved? No, you didn't have to. That was a very simple message. You're a sinner, you need Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Jesus come into my heart, and you felt it. If you got saved, you know what I'm talking about. The Holy Spirit came to live in you, and you ain't never been the same. Right? You ain't never been the same when you invite the Holy Spirit on the inside of your heart. And guess what? Now, if we're going to continue the same way you received him, 
so shall you continue to walk in him. As I keep my faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for me, I'm surrendering to the presence of the Lord and the Holy Spirit is cutting stuff away. Amen. So you were dead in trespasses and sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. But look at this. God has made you alive together, alive together with him, having forgiven you all of your trespasses. So in the old days, whenever, um, whenever, you know what? Let me, let me, let me go back to, I want to show you something real quick. Colossians chapter two. And then we're going we're gonna to kind of like bring it to an end because I don't want to overdo you. I'm switching over to the ESV real quick. I promise I won't keep you too much longer. Um, look at this. I like the way the ESV says this. You see this, the way this wording is, it shows you if with Christ, you died. See, because the other translations don't use this word spirits in there. And this is exactly what it's talking about. Remember how I talked to you about the first order of things, the original arrangement that fallen spirits have been vexing the hearts and minds of men all the way back to ancient days. And can I newsflash? They ain't taking a nap right now. Oh, science wants us to believe it's something else when people act a certain way, but it's not. It's demonic spirits, vexing people, vexing sometimes you and I. If we're not careful, we'll open up doors. And then we don't understand why we're being driven in a certain way. But anyway, that's another story. If with Christ you die to the elemental, or that word elemental is the same as principle. It's those first things. If you died in Christ, you died to those elemental spirits of the world, Right? Why is if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to their regulations? Okay, whatever it is, it's, it's types of teachings that are telling you what, you know, th this is how you're supposed to live for God. And there's other spots in there where it says, don't fall into, uh, into these teachings. Look at, look, look at this. He said, they don't submit to regulations. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. You know, I used to say that, teach this all the time. They used to say, don't go to rated R movies. Don't go to PG-13. You know, they're probably right. I mean, if we're honest with one another. I mean, they got some garbage up in that stuff, right? Okay, and is it affecting your spirit, man? Yes, it is, but look. But, but look, the problem is, is that you can't make a rule out of it. If you make a rule out, I shall not watch PG-13. I will watch PG, but not PG-13. Well, you can watch a PG show that's full of black magic. You, can, you understand what I'm trying to make? What, the point that I'm trying to make, I'm not trying to call you out if you're watching rated R movies or rated X movies. That's between you and the Lord right now. I'm just telling you, you're vexing yourself if, you, if you're watching the wrong kind of thing. I will tell you that. But what, I am, but what I am trying to say is this, is that the right way to get freedom over it is not to take your computer out and beat it up with a Louisville slugger. Even though that may show that you're determined to, and you have a desire to li love God and live for God, that's not what's gonna really set you free because now you got a porn movie in your brain. Okay, does that make sense? It's a, I hope it's okay to speak these things out loud. So, so right. look, but this is what I wanted you to see right here, all right? Canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, all right? You know what? We're gonna, I'll tell you what. Let's just pray because we're going to pick this up again, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll preach it on, an, on another, even on a Sunday. But, but look. I want you to understand that there was a record of debt that was connected to the law. The law called us guilty. The good news is that Jesus moved it out of the way. The good news is that now he disarmed. I want you to see that part, and we'll talk about that more the next time we visit this because this is really where I wanted to get you. He disarmed these rulers and authorities. They have no right to hold us down. He gave us victory when he died on the cross. He, he took away their power. He, he triumphed over them. And now when we place faith in him, now I want y'all, I want y'all come to the front and we'll, we'll go out of here worshiping the Lord. But look, when he died, he took away from them because you, you understand the reason why it works that way is because before you and I died to sin, we were bound by sin. 
Before we died to sin, we were bound by sin because we were all born in sin. And so these spirits had a right to hold mankind down because Adam, the first man, opened up the door. He opened up the door and we all been vexed by demon spirits. But now in Christ, we're new creations in Christ. And now in Christ, we have victory over the works of evil. Amen? Amen. We do. Praise God. Let's